Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, president of the Artist Talk on Art. Um, this is our 71st virtual open studio. Uh, this has been our response to COVID. We are finally going to turn a corner and go back to live talks starting October 4th, Monday, and every first of the month, Monday, so monthly talks. But we'll continue this COVID format of online talks weekly and uh, possibly change how many a month. But for now, welcome. We have an interesting presentation today of photographers related to photo photo gallery. First, some things about the ATOA. Uh, we're an organization since 1975 providing talks in New York City in the Lower West Side. Um, artists talking on art uh, with a long history. Um, we are 501c3. All our talks are free. If you'd like to contribute all our information about our, in our calendar, what talks are to come, and about our history is at atoanyc.org. And information about contributing is there as well. Uh, I want to welcome Pamela Waldrop of Photo Photo Gallery. She's organized and she is an artist in this talk and she'll co-moderate with me. Uh, these are three photographers, including Andrea Fortunoff and Paul Mealy. Um, we should have, uh, we, we like to have engaged dialogue. Certainly we want to listen, but feel free to jump in at any time, share your thoughts. And as well as the ATOA continues, if you have ideas for dialogues on the arts or want to participate, send me information. I can always forward it to the planning committee and we can organize something. So welcome Pamela and first thank you all the artists for your time, for sharing and uh, welcome from the ATOA. There are on mute here. Pam, you're muted. Okay, take two. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Pamela Waldrop. Uh, I am one of the photographers and also the president of Photo Photo Gallery. And I want to thank uh, Barry uh, very much for inviting us. Um, I, I loved, uh, I actually reviewed again uh, before other photo, photo gallery artists who spoke previously, and that was organized by Susan. It was wonderful. And uh, I want to thank you not only for inviting us, but for doing this. It's so important. And the fact that you do it weekly is absolutely phenomenal uh, and that you have a regular following. So thank you very much. I uh, just want to say a little bit about Photo Photo Gallery. It is a, uh, it is a not-for-profit uh, collective that's located in Huntington, New York. Uh, we presently have uh, almost 20 uh, uh, photographers in our gallery. And uh, I think uh, one of the things that I, it's very important for me to say is that we were closed for five months. And after five months, we reopened and doubled our size and added seven members. So uh, the, the uh, people are hungry, you know, to stay in the arts and to support, support the community. And uh, I'm so proud of us and so glad that we can, you know, be a, a part of this bigger thing as well. So in, uh, in addition to me, um, Paul Mealy and uh, Andrea Fortunoff, uh, are going to be speaking as well. And so Barry, uh, I have a little introduction, but it might make more sense if I do that after I speak about myself or now. Oh. Yeah, I think just give a little introduction. Sure. Okay, uh, okay. Um, Paul is, uh, well, let me say this, something that I'm very happy about is that we have many, many members in our, uh, in Photo Photo Gallery who are also members of other galleries. I think that's awesome. I think, you know, that if, if you can be a member of both galleries and also su support the local, um, um, you know, arts act organizations, it's wonderful. So Paul Mealy, um, who is, uh, has an intriguing perspective on life, and uh, has, I just had the good fortune of doing a solo show with him about uh, where he um, featured the series he's going to be talking about today. Uh, he is well known for his abandonment series. Uh, I know Paul for his unique perspective and his absolutely uncanny ability to print. I don't know anybody who's a better printer than Paul. 
Um, he also gives very honest, right on target feedback. Andrea is also, uh, Andrea Fortunoff is also a member of BJ Spoke. I'll give you a little plug here now. She has a solo show coming up at BJ Spoke. And uh, what I, I'm, I'm so happy that Andrea is part of our gallery. She is relatively new to us uh, and she brings quite a varied background in multimedia to our gallery. So uh, she will be having a solo show in our gallery in November as well. So um, um, the, the, uh, the thing I think many of you will enjoy too is that all three of us do very diverse work. So let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I am not from New York, in case you figured that out. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, uh, Southern Indiana, moved around mega times. Uh, I, you know, tell people I moved around like 17 times and it, it really informs the connection and the way that I approach my work, having moved that much. Um, I went to undergraduate school at Ohio University, graduate school at CW Post on Long Island, and I retired, uh, oh my God, I can't believe it's going on, this will be the fifth year that I'm not teaching digital photography, um, darkroom photography, or a, a foundation level fine arts class. So a um, lot of changes along the way, but they are all very much a part of how I approach my work. So before I share the screen, I, I want to share this and I want I, I would like to hear from the rest of you too about this. I, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to talk about today. And um, you know, the advice was to speak about one series. That's not my life. It's not how I work. It's, it's, not, it's not why I work. So um, I, I'd like to hear about, you know, what informs your works as well. So uh, that said, uh, let me, I'm not, I may need some help in like doing this, the share thing. So let's see, share screen. I want to go to, uh-oh, uh is it not giving me, Somebody may have to help me out here a little bit. Why am I not able to share my screen? Mike's going to jump in, Mike Krausowitz, but uh, just uh, press the green button, share screen. I did. Okay, I did. I'll start again. And what's open on your computer, ideally, is what you want to show. Uh, I don't really want to. It, it's saying that I can't share. Pamela, what you want to do is put what you want to show on the screen first, right? So that's ready to go and then hit share screen and then there'll be one that looks like your desktop. That's what you're going to click on. Okay. I have everything in one folder. So open that folder first. Exactly. And, and okay. close, close other things you have open. Once again, everybody welcome. This is Artist Talk on Art. We're 501c3. We will be going back to Live Talks the first Monday of the month, starting October 4th, and welcome. Okay, I'll try this again. Uh, I shared my screen before. I'm not sure why this is not working. Uh, Do you want to send a uh, your presentation to Michael Krasowitz. Mike, you want to put your email in? It's, not in, it's individual folders. It, it's not a PowerPoint. Um, uh, shall we go to Andrea and then have you figure it out after? Uh, sure. <laughs> let's, do, let's do that. And you can, uh, uh, Michael, see if you can get a bunch of folders from, from her and just open them one at a time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Emily, uh, let's have a conversation on the chat, okay? Okay. Thanks. So, Andrea, do you, do you feel ready? Uh, I guess so. Um, I didn't hear the thing about just one project, so I'm going to, you're going to. Yeah. Uh, that looks good. Um, okay, whoops, let me, 
hold on, I need to <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So this picture here is a picture that it's it's actually a scan of a slide. I took this photo when I was 13 years old with the first camera that uh, I was given that had controls on it. That, that was not a, a, a Polaroid. And uh, I was with my dad and he saw me taking this picture and my dad is, was a very, very avid photographer. And he was like, what the hell are you taking a picture of? <laughs> and so I said, I'm taking a picture of the light. And that's really what photography is for me. It's, it's about following the light around and seeing how it bounces around on surfaces and textures and what it hides is just as important to me as what it illuminates. So I had a pretty good education and I ended up going to college in New Orleans, which really shaped my view of the world. So down here on the bottom left is a picture on Red Street, a sunset. You know, New Orleans is a wild and very weird place, at least back in the uh, late 70s and 80s when I was there. And um, when I was in college, all of my friends were architects, even though I was not an architect major. Uh, I graduated with a degree in systems theory and uh, came back up to New York and began to work. My other great joy in life, aside from photography, the same year that I learned to take pictures, I also began to dance. I came back up to New York after I graduated from college and, and after a while I decided that computers was not for me and I went back to school in architecture. Uh, so that's kind of a capsule of my, my bio. This series here is, is I'm starting out with what's going to be at BJ Spoke Gallery. Uh, the show will open on Wednesday. So this series is based on dance. And uh, I was trying to show how time is represented, you know, how can, you can represent time in dance. And the way I initially looked at it was, this is the studio floor in the basement of Alvin Ailey in New York, uh, the actual rehearsal floor. You can see at the top where they drag the piano across the floor and all of the scrapes from the shoes and people just dragging their feet across the floor. Uh, in this particular photo, a lot of these people I know and photographed. Uh, and I just tried to show kind of a diversity of dance through time in, in this initial photo. Uh, this one is kind of, I, I have been doing African dance for about 25 years. And I was in a conundrum how to figure out how do you show time in a place where there is no floor. So, you know, when you dance in the dirt, you leave footsteps. And so this is kind of my way of representing time in a natural environment where you have just all kinds of different footprints in the ground when you're done dancing. This series was also um, done with 
uh, Cochenia Dancers. Cochenia is the dance company that uh, I, I, I danced with before, not in a performance, but I you know, go to rehearsals and, and things like that. Um, and I was trying to represent the social aspect of dancing. And for me, the best way to show that experience is, is kind of in an architectural format. When you look at a stained glass window in a church, you are getting a story and it becomes a social experience because you're sitting in a building and you're, you're experiencing it with other people. So this was kind of my way of showing dance in more of a, a social context. Um, this is another one that I did based on the first concept. I introduced music scores in here and an attempt uh, to just also demonstrate the history and the time. And, and, and most of these scores are genre appropriate here. So uh, there's a belly dancer, there's a belly dance floor where there's cowboy boots, there's, you know, that uh, a Western score and salsa and tango. Uh, this is another remake of the, uh, what I call dance story with the feet. Uh, the guy on the left, Vado Diamonde is the, is the director of Cochenia. Uh, this is another stained glass one. Two. So I also do straight landscapes. This was, uh, I took on a trip out west in 2017. And this here was done in uh, Central Park. I call this Central Park six feet apart because this was done during COVID and nobody would get closer than six feet to each other. Uh, this is a travel photo that I took up in uh, Sikkim, which is the northernmost province of India, right uh, near the border of, the, of uh, China and uh, Tibet. This photo, well, it's not a photo. This is a, a piece that I did um, as a result of COVID and my recovery from COVID. I, all my hair fell out. And so this is a compilation of 28 <laughs> clumps of hair that I saved and arranged, you know, sort of, I chose 28 because it's women, when women lose their hair, they freak out. And I was absolutely no exception to this rule. And, um, you know, 28 days in a menstrual cycle is why I picked that number. So it's seven times four. Uh, they are not really manipulated all that much in terms of photography. I, they're scanned and imported. And uh, it, 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 for me, this is a very, very significant piece. It kind of helped me to get over my fear of just having everything fall out of my head. So now I'm going to preview what is going to be up in my show at Photo Photo. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Pam, I believe it's October, not November, but uh, me and Alan uh, are, are gonna be on the opposite walls from each other. So I call this, this series Wasted. And uh, I've heard this kind of photography referred to as ruined porn. And for me, this really is not that. Um, this, this series for me is, is about all of these manufactured objects that take a great deal of skilled labor to make and that we just throw away because we, as a society, don't appreciate 
what it takes to make things. We treat everything like trash. And because we don't respect skilled manual labor, at least that's my opinion of it. Uh, and that was kind of the, the premise for this series. Uh, there's my apocalyptic shopping carts and thank you. Yes, Andrea, uh, Alyssa Pritzker says, uh, the vibrancy of your photography is compelling. Andrea Gordon asks, how do you uh, integrate your architecture background and your photography? She says, actually, how you do that is heartfelt. Sorry, um, oh. it's heartfelt. Um, show us those images again, especially at the end. You went a little quick and they really were something. You certainly have more time. Oh, okay. uh, you, you're um, showing a, a range of work within okay. your own and the personal work that you did with your hair. Very touching. Oh, that one. You want me to go back there? Yeah, just sh keep show a few, you know, you did, I think, run quickly at the end. Um, okay. This one. I don't know. Can you see the bar? The floating bar. I was if seeing you that, can't see it, I'll leave it there. You were seeing that hair. The sort of uh, okay. the scanned images. Right. That, right. That's right. Go forward. Show what you like. Again, okay. everybody, we're artists book on art. We have three presenters from Photo Photo Gallery, a talk that was organized um, by Pamela Waldrop. And uh, we have Andrea Fortuna presenting. So I'm, I'm just gonna go back here. This photo was taken in uh, the Medibemp salvage yard. I, I, uh, when I first went there, I was completely overwhelmed. There, there was just, this is like a tiny little hundredth slice of, of everything that was up there. There's, there's boats piled on top of cars, piled on top of trucks, piled on top of tires, there's everything that you can imagine that we throw away, washing machines and dryers and refrigerators and, and um, air conditioning units, the coils from air conditioning units. It, it's just, as someone, I guess, who is an architect and who knows what goes into making this stuff and putting it together, it, it just seeing all of it trashed just, um, was, was, I can't say that I like sat down and cried because I, I kind of know that that's what we do as a society, but it's just, I, I particularly appreciate people who work in metal and I designed a lot of stuff that required custom metal work as an architect. And so when I first started as an architect, there were metal workers on Long Island. Then they got pushed off Long Island and they ended up in Brooklyn. And they got pushed out of Brooklyn and they ended up in the Bronx and they got pushed out of the Bronx and they went to New Jersey. And then they were pushed out of New Jersey and they ended up in Pennsylvania. Then they got pushed out of Pennsylvania and they ended up in Ohio. I don't know what's happened. That's like a 30 year span of where I would have to go to get custom metal work. So it's just, um, we don't appreciate all of the training and skill that goes into making this stuff and, and, and we just prefer cheap <laughs> to well-made. So this is kind of my manifesto <laughs> against that, I guess. Okay, um, Barry, can you hear me? Yes, yes. I, I, I have, for some reason, all my controls just like literally self-control disappeared. So I can't interact. I can't see my mute button. I can't. Pamela, do you want to try and uh, logging off and come back on? I, I think that might be necessary. I also, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Andrea, because I also want to be able to interact with you. Um, you can't, you can't I, I also sent you, um, I sent you, a file that I, the folder that I was trying to uh, share. 
it's a big folder, but you might be able to open it and nail drop. And I sent it to Michael. I don't know why I can't. So I will log out and try to go back in. I apologize. No problem, Pamela. We, we, it, it's all new for us. And even when we're used to the format, there's always a glitch, uh, but we always get through it. Uh, feel free to continue, Andrea. And uh, certainly the black and white images, all the work's quite beautiful and strong. Um, and the one sort of garbage, met, yeah, but the black and whites have a, a stronger mood or tone that are just incredible. They're really beautiful. Um, and I've been doing collage work. And when I see your garbage dump, it looks like collage materials that are absurd in a collage you might do, but there it is in reality. Um, and I did have a metalworking factory. I know what the stamping machines and polishing and uh, soldering and cleaning and design and working with motors. And it's quite complicated to get these things. And they are you know, treated like trash. It's a shame. Yeah, yeah definitely. But very beautiful. And you see the architectural influence as well, sort of organized disorder. Yes, yes. Organized disorder is a very good way. For that. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, please? I'd love to hear them. Constance says, I love the image of all the discarded images, all the discarded objects, I mean. Andrea, where is this garbage dump that you found? It's it's actually called the salvage yard there. It's in Medibemps, Maine. The town is actually called Medibemps. <laughs> Do you have access to it any time of the day or is it? Um, no, when you go up there, you have to call the, the two managers and get permission to go in because they are, so, so when I first went in, um, I, they only let me go like a hundred yards into the, the dump the first year that I went up there. And I did manage to get some nice pictures and I gave that to them. And then the second year I went back, they said, okay, because they have insurance and they were, it's very easy to misstep and um, cut yourself, there, there's no paths. And so you are literally climbing among heaps of garbage and, um, or salvage. And a lot of it is sharp and corroded. And they, not to mention, there's tons and tons and tons of killer mosquitoes from Maine. And uh, they, they, you have to go in with mosquito-proof clothing and, you know, deep all over you. Otherwise, you just... <laughs> attacked. Andrea, but, uh, uh, Andrea, Alyssa Pritzke asks, uh, what, what is your most current interest um, to photograph? And as well, uh, from the New York Artist Circle, uh, they, they love your photography and ask what cameras, what cameras, and I would add what lenses are you using when you're shooting? Um, I have a Sony RX10. And uh, that's a fixed lens. It, it, I mean, it, it's a telephoto, it's a 24 to 600, but um, it's, it doesn't come off the camera. It's kind of a travel photography camera. Um, and my current interest is uh, still, you know, I'm very, very interested in photographing dancers, which is a very new thing for me photographing people. I've avoided photographing people my entire life. So, <laughs> um, and I, I still enjoy I, to photograph, when I, when I photograph architecture, I really like to photograph the fringes of neighborhoods where you have architecture meeting nature in a very unruly manner, we'll put it that way, where there's a contest between the weeds and the lot, or what's built on the lot. Uh, we know who wins that contest in the long term. Um, 
I, I'll read a comment or two more and then we'll move on to Paul. Uh, Kathleen Anderson asked, can you talk about your relationship to the African dance group? Oh, okay. Um, I've been dancing with Cochenia for um, eight years, I would say. And um, like I said, I don't perform with them anymore. There was a very short time that I performed in Ailey with them in the extension, okay? In, in the Ailey extension with them. Uh, and it's, it's really a multi, it's a multi-ethnic dance core. And it, the style of dance is Cote d'Ivoire, West, West African, but uh, Vado is, fluent in, I don't know, 20 to 30 dance styles that are prevalent among, I believe, the 60 different languages and tribes that inhabit the Ivory Coast. He, wa he was a member of the uh, Cote d'Ivoire Ballet. He stands for the president of the Ivory Coast. And he came to the US in 1995 or 96. And uh, I actually danced first with his cousin, uh, Mamadou Dahoué at the time. And uh, unfortunately, Mamadou died about 10 years ago. And then I began to dance with Vada. But dancing to, to drums is, is very different than, than to live drums is very different than dancing with Andrea. With all the music. Uh, Andrea? Yes? Hi, yeah, I'm back. I'm so, so I apologize for all that. I, I, you know, I, anyway, let me get to the point here. Uh, and I, if I'm repeating what somebody else asked you about, I'm sorry, but I, as I look at this image and as I, you know, look at some of your other images, which are more straightforward when it comes to the relationship with da dance. I see in this image and others of yours, how much your, well, I'm wondering if you could tell me how your architectural background and your um, uh, experience, dance experiences approach the way you, uh, or influence the way you approach this subject, because I see it, this is a dance. Yeah, I mean, our architecture is about space. And um, I mean, you know, there's the famous quote that architecture is frozen music. Uh, but, you know, dance is moving through space. So, uh, I, you know, I'm very conscious of when I'm walking outside or what I'm, I'm very conscious of space and, and people's boundaries as they move around and the built environment, how it affects how people move through space, which it does considerably uh, with doorways and windows and, uh, you know, buildings direct where you go and cannot go in the built environment. And, uh, you know, you, choose an environment like your house because you feel comfortable in that space. Dance is for me more about moving to music than about moving in the particular space. But up until recently, I haven't really been able to, or I haven't focused on conveying to other people how I feel about that moving to music. I, I just, just to finish my thought here, um, in this particular piece, obviously you didn't arrange this, but you cropped it to arrange the rhythm and the dance through the space. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a wonderfully uh, remarkable piece. Uh, I love it. Thank you, thank you. Eileen Novak says, we don't as a, as a society don't appreciate the creation of many of the consumer items we buy, clothes, food, all the refuge of our society. Not many of us could create them. Nice to see a series on how much we discard 
many times needlessly. Great series, Andrea. Very nice. Very nice. She says she looks forward to seeing more about the dance work at DJ Spoke. Um, and uh, a New York Athletic Club, if anyone's interested, is mentioning something, some equipment for sale in the chat. We're going to move forward uh, to our next presenter, Paul Mealy. Uh, I want to remind everyone, this is Artist Talk on Art, the ATOA. We've been around since 1975. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Anything and everything about us, our history, our archives, with the American Archives of Art, the Smithsonian, and as well, our calendar and what's to come is on our website. We will be going live October 4th at 12 West 12th Street. So Paul, welcome. Paul, uh, another artist, a member of the group Photo Photo Gallery. And uh, certainly uh, we got a great introduction um, from Pamela, an intriguing view on life. I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, and great. Now I have to live up to this. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> Uh, okay, I guess I'll just dive right into it. Um, so my name is Paul Mealy. I am the photographer and vice president of Photo Photo Gallery. And this was the last show that I had presented at Photo Photo with Pam. Pam and I were in a group show together. Uh, originally, we were going to mold our work together and then realized that probably wasn't going to work. And when you see my particular work, you might understand why. I, like myself, like Andrea, uh, I'm not big on shooting people. This is probably as close as I've come to doing it in a, in a very long time. And let's go for a ride. So, uh, hold on, I gotta find the button. Okay, so the name of the show was Pure Imagination. So here is a synopsis of the body of work. Uh, should I read it or should I let everybody read it on their own? Whatever you prefer, Paul. Okay, I'll, I'll try and read it. I, I stumble over my own words, but I'll give it a shot. Okay, so what began as a one day workshop at the American Treasure Tour took on a life of its own when I began meeting my new friends, Rory, Mary Bell, and Andy. Over a span of two more visits, I ended up meeting others just like them. Inspiration truly took hold and I felt just like a wild, a wide eyed child running around with a camera in a world of pure imagination. I have this saying on my front door where my keys go, growing old is mandatory, growing up is optional. Those of you who know me know this is probably the motto of my life. As children, we rely on our, our imagination to take us to, yeah. To, <laughs> this again as children we rely on our imagination to take us to make believe places to meet people we never really met and experience things beyond our young understanding of the world around us we project stories onto the objects we hold most sacred as children which is our toys we name them take them on adventures introduce them as if they were real as we are we live through them they are pure, and that world is pure we grow, uh, we grow up, we grow older, and our, and our world changes. Priorities shift, and we lose part of our, imagina our imaginative innocence that once came so easily. It becomes locked away along with our inner child, but it can never truly be stamped out. I invite you to, to all to take that, to come meet some new friends, give them names, make up stories, and become a child again. So before I start, I need to give you a background on the place that I shot at and at the workshop, which was the American Treasure Tour. And it is housed in a former BNF tire factory in Oaks, PA. The American Treasure Tour is a privately owned collection by one person who wishes to remain anonymous at his request. The collection includes, but is not restricted to carousel band organs, calipods, Nickelodeons, also known as orchestrations, movie posters, celebrity photographs, vinyl records from 33s, 48s, uh, 48s and 78s, Edison collider players, antique modern animated, animated store displays, circus and clown art, pedal cars, model airplanes, and classic cars. The American Treasure Tour comprises of 100,000 square feet, which is about the size of a big box store. 
And to show you how cluttered and on top of everything is, I took some photos off of their website. And when you go in there, they actually take you on a guided tour on a, I guess you would call these little trolley cars or whatever you want to call them. So when the gallery, when the museum is actually open, you're not allowed to walk around. You have to come in the cars and they give you a guided tour. This place is covered from head to toe in items and singling them out and trying to isolate them is a job all in of itself. And to me, that was half the fun. It was just very overwhelming and oh, so, so much fun. Uh, yes. How did you uh, initially hear about this place? Okay, uh, a friend of mine introduced me to Matthew Christopher, who is an abandoned photographer, does workshops out of this place. And a friend of mine told me that they're doing abandoned workshops there and she knows my fascination for dolls and clowns and all this weird stuff. And I took a ride there for fun and it turned into a project and it probably turned into the project I liked the most out of all my bodies of work so far. Good? Yeah, thanks. Oh, okay. So I will introduce you now to the people that I have found amongst all the uh, craziness in there. So this first one, I named him Clarence. Clarence was named after my father's bird who sadly flew away one day when my dad took him outside to get the mail, slammed the mailbox, scared the bird and the bird flew away. My titles and influences usually come from song titles, but from this, it came from a lot of different other places that I'll explain as I'm going. Uh, arrow. Next. This is Jack and Spencer. So for Jack, I wanted a very, no offense to anybody named Jack, generic name, a very simple name for him. And the name Jack for me seemed perfect. And the little dog on the bottom left is a tribute to my cat Spencer, who I adopted six months ago and now runs the house. And I love the name and I figured I wanted to give him a little homage. This is Mary Bell. I wanted an old timey name for Mary Bell because she has an old timey feel for me. The deep, the darker part of Mary Bell, which is part of my weird fascination with serial killers, her name came from an 11 year old girl named Mary Bell Flora who wound up killing two four year old kids in 1968. My cartoonish slash sadistic weird personality weaves in and out of my work all the time. This is Andy. Andy was named after the late comedian Andy Kaufman. And I don't know if anybody has seen Man on the Moon, but it's one of my favorite movies. And for some reason, I just saw or heard his voice coming out of this doll. And the fact that he's missing a hand is one of the weird magic tricks that Andy Kaufman would always try to do to trick people into seeing things that weren't there. This is Lester. Not sure where the name came from this one. He, he's animatronic. I caught him in mid laugh as the body went back and, and retracted and, and jerked as he opens up. And the name Lester just came out and I said, that's Lester and why not? Okay, so this is Carl. My original idea for this exhibit I was going to do more of a circus vignette where each character was going to have their own their own job description, their own title, but it was going to be through alliteration. So this was going to be Carl the Caveman Cowboy, which he is a caveman and a cowboy, and he reminds me a little of the Dos Equis guy for some strange reason. Hmm. So I... Um, Mom said it has fabric. Oh, Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I uh, decided to drop the alliterations pretty quickly, and I also decided to drop the circus vignettes pretty quickly, but the name Carl stuck, and that's what I decided to keep. This is Lola. She was named after a friend of mine from college. They kind of shared a very similar hairstyles and somewhat gothic-y look, I guess. 
Lola is also a name that I just really always liked as a girl's name and it just stuck for me. So I went with it. Well, yeah. well Andrea Fortune, Fortune off is asking what kind of lens do you use? And Alyssa Pritzka asks, what are the sizes of your photograph? And Eileen Novak points out the stuff of nightmares, Paul. At one point you said, and there's a dark side to this picture. And I was like, I was hoping you were gonna say there's some light side to it, but uh, uh, quite fascinating, moving, emotional, you know, frozen, scary, a lot of things. Uh, what are your lenses um, and what sizes do you like to print? The lenses, the le I used, I think, pretty much one lens for this. It was a 28 to 300, which is pretty much all I feel like I ever really need, unless I'm really shooting long distances. Uh, these printed, I tend to stick between 28, not 28, hello, 12 to 18, uh, 12 by 18 or 18 by 12. These usually about as big as I'll print. It's the size I just kind of learned to like. And as to what you're saying with the darkness, I think in my work, and I'm noticing it more so ever since I really started doing these, is my work tends to go back and forth, especially with, like Andrea was saying with light. But I like to keep my personality in these pictures. So I feel like there's a childlike wonder in a lot of these, undertoned with a very gritty dark side. And I'm not saying I'm a mean person by spirit, but I think I have a very I navigate more towards darker imagery of like macabre style injury um, imagery, but I also love like Looney Tunes. So this is just me. This is my childlike and my adult mixing together. Andrea Gordon says, uh, as we discussed so long ago, they are truly on the fence of the emotion they evoke. However, they lean to the dark, I must admit. Well, oh, your, your earliest experiences with the arts, what did you do? Were you a comic book drawer? Were you, uh, did you pick up drawing late? What did you photograph first when you started? I can't draw to save my life, which is one of the reasons I picked up a camera. Uh, I could draw a stick figure and it'll be very unproportioned. Um, I started photography when I was 31. I went back to Nassau after I had a really bad car accident and managed to find my way back into college. And so I didn't pick up a camera until I was about 31 years old. I mean, I used to take old film cameras to concerts and take photos, but I had no idea what I was doing. I just hit the button and whatever came out, came out. So I didn't really start picking up a camera until I was 31 and start really learning. My fascination has always been with abandoned buildings and things of that nature. But stuff like this has also fascinated me as well. And like I said, this to me out of all my work so far was, this is the body of work I feel the closest to. And it also feels like the one I know the best. One of the thing, oops. Pam? Um, yes. <laughs> one of the things that uh, I, along with uh, other photo photo members that are here tonight uh, got to see was the uh, impact that your show had to see several of these together. Uh, I'm trying to remember, were there 11, 12? How many 11. pieces? 11, I'm almost, I'm almost through them all. Okay, but I, I was trying to remember, and it makes quite an impact to see them almost as a, as a gallery of people, not, not gallery in the art sense, but as a, a collection of a crowd. You know, when you walked in, uh, the impact was pretty strong. Um, I disagree with you about your, uh, your not having the light side, because I know from our conversations about your work that you, that you do not manipulate your environment and you look for the light and you find it and you found it in these too. It oh, comes no, light isn't like lighthearted nature. and No, I mean, that's what I'm talking about too. That's just my, my take on it. I, I think, I think it comes through in your work. Oh, I always, even when I edit my, my abandoned photos, I feel like there's always a sense of hope behind them, even in the dreariness, but I do that on purpose. I like the contrast. Yeah. Okay, so that was, we good? That was Lola. Okay, this is Phil. 
I was never quite sure if Phil was a musician or a motician. Either way, he reminded me of the producer Phil Spector. I think it has something to do with hair. And it also found it ironic that there just happens to be another killer mixed in with all this work since he was convicted of murder. This is Edna. She was one of the first ones that I think I believe I finished. And for publicity purposes, she needed a name. And this was before I really knew where I was going with the work and how I was gonna name them. Pam told me we just need something to put a title for it. So I, she felt like an ant to me. And I needed the ant something. So I pictured her as somebody sitting in a rocking chair and sewing and telling the stories. And for some reason, the word Edna popped into my head, which was the cranky woman from the vacation movie with Chevy Chase. And I always liked the flow of Aunt Edna. I eventually dropped the Aunt part and just kept the Edna part. So this is Maybelline. Another, my father again coming into play because my father is a big Chuck Berry fan. And as I grew up around this music, it always stuck with me. I, I'm familiar with all of it. And all those different artists from that time period always had songs about girls and the word Maybelline for some reason just stuck out. And she needed a name and Maybelline was it. I also like the fact that this one was placed right next to Rory and it looked like she's actually reaching for his cupcake who looks like he does not want to give it up. Uh, Rory, his name came from the fact that I grew up on The Simpsons, which most people my age have. And in an episode of The Simpsons, Krusty the Clown adopts the alter ego of Rory B. Bellows when trying to avoid the IRS. And I like the name Rory, and that was the name I decided to give him. And to me, these all worked together. I called them their friends. I felt like they were a group of people that, or kids, or whatever you want to call them, that all worked together. And I just had a blast doing this. This was like the most fun I think I've ever had shooting. Didn't you go back three times, Paul? This was a, yeah, this was a, a period over three um, sessions. There were four hours a piece. So I ran around that place a lot. I took a lot of photographs, but it was also very hard to isolate these things, not realizing how much stuff is actually around them, behind them, in front of them, in the side of them. The lighting in there is very intense. It's very circus-esque in, in, in some respects strobe lights, floodlights, different colors. The lights in this were all natural. I didn't bring a strobe. I didn't bring any flashes with me. I don't use any of that stuff. Paul? Yes. Did the the tram that you're on, does it stop at any time or are you did you shoot these while you were moving? Okay, so the tram is only when when the workshop is after the gallery closes and you're allowed to run around where the tram goes. But this is only during the workshops. When you pay for the workshop, they let you do that. If you go there as just to see the gap, just to see the museum, then you have to stay on the tram. So when I got there the first time, I got there early, so I took a ride on the tram because I wanted to get a familiar familiarize myself with the place. So when they finally closed and they let us run around, they took all the the ropes down. I knew exactly where I was going. Plus, I also got a history lesson from the lady who was running the tram. Paul, do you see yourself uh, continuing this kind of series? I would love to do more stuff like this if I could find them. I think I kind of got burnt out on that place, so I think I'm done with that. But um, if I could find more stuff like this, I would do it in a heartbeat. If anybody, um, if anybody hasn't seen Paul's work on Instagram, I suggest that you take a look at it, his abandonment series. I have it on here, but I don't know if I have enough time to go through right. it. I just want to bring this up because I've noticed that recently in the images that you just shot on your most recent photo trip, there are people in them. Previously, your abandonment series did not include any people. And that seems to be a big change. This body of work, I think, and a specific shoot that I went on with a bunch of friends, I can signal those two trips out as a turning point in what I'm doing. Mm. 
I've even had this discussion with one of my friends. I mean, I have to ban this stuff on here. I can go through it really quick. If not, then, you know, I, I, if, if you tell me, I, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing at this point. No, you've got uh, some more time. I've got you set to go about another four or five minutes. So sure, share some more. Sure, I'll, I won't go through with the actual project, um, the, the whole meaning behind it, but I can just go through the pictures really quick if that's okay. Of course, uh, Andrea Fortunoff says, I like the way you tell a story for each figure. I mean, these are very alive portraits. These are uh, personalities that are rich with your slices of your personality and sort of things you play with. Um, if not, they're you, you're, you're sort of engaging them. These are not disconnected from your lens and you behind it at all. Um, but very strong work. You, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I often don't recommend artists go larger and I like 12 by 18 by 16 that size. But you know, if you go up in scale, all of a sudden those figures dwarf the viewer and it becomes a different relationship. And they're so powerful, I think of it, you know, it's an option to height, height them. I really, uh, I really try and give artists advice, but I often always do and I never hold back. So just take it as a- uh, No, I appreciate that. I, I, I actually, if it wasn't for the fact that it cost so much to frame them, I would have went bigger. Uh, Barry, and what one of the things Paul didn't say, and it's interesting that you should suggest that, several of the figures that were in Paul's series were life-size. Yes, most, a lot of them were. So should I just run through these real quick, or do I need, what should I do? As I always say, we are, uh... Uh, sort of visual junkie, so yes. So this was my In Absentia show. This was the last show I did before Pure Imagination. This is also gonna be on display in Soho Gallery in October, I believe. So this is all shot in a couple of different places between New York, Connecticut, and stuff like that. Paul, was this the show that you chose to um, print uh, and not have glass on top of it? So that yes. you can do the texture? That's, okay, that's what I thought. I actually like the fact that the glass wasn't intruding on these and I just felt like they worked better without it. I also like the fact that they didn't look classical and they didn't have the mats around them. I just like the way the work just stuck out and stayed in there. I will say, uh... I almost laugh when in the beginning you said, uh, uh, Pamela, you know, these are just three random artists. Of course, whenever you hear that, you know you're going to get artists that have links that you just didn't know. And just compare how you work with detritus and random decaying form to what we saw earlier by uh, Andrea Fortunoff. And you see how, yes, you're very different, but uh, you're finding appeal in the sort of a micro destruction you see of often beautiful macro products. Hey, remember this one? This was a tough one, I remember. Lots of editing in that dark spot. That's it. That was excellent, thank you. Let me... I'll stop screen sharing. Oh yeah, oh, I gotta do that. Uh, all right, now I got Pam's work I gotta dig out. Give me a second. Okay. Firstly, I let's just thank, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, thank Paul. I forgot, we always applaud at the ATOA. And so extra applause as well for Andrea Fortunoff. I mean, this is about, uh, you know, we like to be positive. Think of it as opposite the college art critique. We like to reinforce <laughs> and we all get something if we listen you know, we're all artists or many of us are, and you know, we know some things, but when you hear someone else, they know some things too, and it sort of makes you richer. Um, so we're gonna move over now to our organizer, to Pamela Waldrop. We had some problems earlier, but as always, we sort of work together as a hive, as a group, and Paul, will be uh, Paul Mealy, who just presented, will be sharing. Again, we're ATOA, 
We're a 501c3. We're Artist Talk on Art. We'll be going to live talk starting October 4th and first of the month, Mondays. We're always Mondays, ATOA Talks, and anything and everything ATOA on our web website, atoanyc.org. So, Paul, I guess just open away uh, files and... Oh, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And thank you guys for being so patient. I, uh, I run Zoom meetings every month and all the time. Boy, it didn't work today. So, Paul, I, I would like to start with uh, the drawings, please. There's just a few. Uh, and uh, just, okay. You see them? No. Is it working or no? Well, just open up one. But can you see it? Yeah, I, see the, I see the folder, yes, but I don't, but they're not open. Oh. So if you just the click folders, on not the space bar, Paul, yes. just click on one at a time and hit the space bar. Okay, hold on. Right. Start with the bottom drawing. Okay, and if you hit the, okay, can you zoom out or not? Or if you double click on it, will it open? Oh, okay, yes. There you are. Okay, so why am I showing you a drawing? This is supposed to be about photography. Well, um, as I said, um, I got a Bachelor of Fine Arts at Ohio University and both my undergraduate and my graduate degrees are in uh, drawing and printmaking. And even though I am, and I have been for many, many years, uh, primarily a photographer and printmaker, my drawing experience uh, is still with me. Um, one of the ways that it shows itself is when I'm editing my photos. Um, when I'm editing uh, in Photoshop extensively, I use both hands almost as if I am working with ink or uh, charcoal and uh, very conscious of the contrast between light and dark. And Paul, you could show the next one up. Uh, I worked uh, for many, many years with light drawings. These are about uh, 24 by 36 inches. Uh, a, a quick gestural drawings. Again, these are about the same size, uh, but always I've, I've been about um, trying to, uh, Notice um, the hyper focus on what I think see as the essence of the details to represent the form, whether it's architectural or organic, as you'll see in some of my later work. Okay, uh, uh, next one. Um, this is this is Sorry. actually. Pardon me. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. That's okay. Thank you. This is actually. Um, a drawing of someone who was uh, an instructor, the mentor, Stan uh, Brodsky. And um, again, um, this was what grabbed my attention. Uh, early on, uh, probably at the age of 16, when I went away to a workshop for two weeks at Ohio University, it was my first exposure to working with uh, the nude figure and with working with contour line drawing, which I imagine many of you are, um, uh, familiar with and that was to really concentrate hone in on uh, the detail. Uh, the last one Paul. The, the drawings that were up before were actually pretty old drawings uh, probably from uh, maybe 20 years ago. This was this past year. I started drawing again uh, and I when I was teaching, I taught at a high school for 33 years, uh, both darkroom and digital photography, but I also taught a foundation level uh, studio class. And I didn't realize how much I missed drawing until I retired. I was drawing with my classes all the time. And so once that was gone, I, I went back to drawing workshops. So that's that's where this came in. So now to go to uh, some of my uh, works. Uh, I want to, Paul, I want to look at the um, series. Uh, okay. And um, let's see. Um, let's start with uh, the uh, Hosta series. 
and these are just one each. And, and I, wanted, I wanted to show you an overview of what I do before showing you just a few of the specific images um, because I don't see things in a singular fashion. I don't shoot for a photo shoot. I was talking to uh, someone earlier today and I shoot all the time. It's like whatever is around me. This was a little bit of the exception, but hopefully you can see a little bit of the influence um, from the earlier uh, drawings that I showed you. Um, some of this work um, is still represented by Alex from own gallery. It was also at Photo Photo Gallery a couple of years ago. Um, uh, my work's usually uh, about uh, 22 by 28 inches framed. Uh, some of these are a little bit smaller, which I'm starting to love. Uh, someone is teaching me that when they're smaller, it invites you to come in closer to take a look. Um, they're, the, the names of these, um, you know, the one up on the upper right is called Torso. Uh, the next one to the left is Carnivale. The next one is Flow. So for me, uh, that was what was represented. What I hope happens, and like I'd like for you guys to think about is, when you see my imagery, does it evoke some kind of memory in you or does it lead you to notice some detail that you might not have noticed previously? Uh, and feel free to jump in anytime. Um, uh, Paul, uh, go to um, the uh, Staircase series. Thank you. Um, this is in Nassau County. Museum of Art and uh, their staircase there. And um, I've shot this staircase many, many times. Most of the time when I am shooting something, of course it's a visual response, but it's more of a visceral response to a physical feeling that I'm having. Um, it might, like in this case, it's, uh, it was a reaction to the lack of almost a gravitational pull. Um, because as soon as I would move just the slightest bit, my, my sense of the space would shift remarkably so that it was like, where's up from down, you know, the light. And um, these are all the same staircase. Um, and again, you know, trying to hone in on the various details. Uh, so that's the overview. And then uh, Paul, um, the architectural series, uh, City Perspectives, yeah, thank you. And this one, a um, little more here than what I wanted to include, but um, it, hopefully you can see kind of the same sense of organization, because whether it's um, a staircase or um, an architectural, uh, or excuse me, a detail from Salman Gundy or uh, the building on the High Line. Uh, there's all an, organi an organization of uh, the various parts to point your eye in a, in a certain direction. Someone once told me and uh, found it kind of fascinating that they felt like sometimes when they looked at my work that there was almost uh, the perspective of an unseen viewer. Uh, as if you're, it, it, and uh, I, you have to tell me what you think about that. And then the last overview um, is the MoMA, uh, MoMA uh, interaction series. And this one um, actually, um, I'd, I'd like to read a little bit from my statement here. Um, I think my intentional searches for random coincidences juxtaposed against the physical and sometimes emotional detachment found a voice through blur and articulation in these multi-layered glimpses of frozen time. A lot was going on here for me. It wasn't just about how did the people line up with, uh, you know, Pollock or Gottlieb or Rothko. It, it was uh, 
the interaction between the painting, the people in the middle, and me, and uh, the the disconnect, the connect, and uh, just um, it was fascinating again to be part of it and to record it at the same time. Those people who know me know that I shoot all the time. Pamela, Pamela, can you reread what you just read to us at the beginning, the intentional search for uh, oh, sure. randomness? Just read it a little slower. That is a very packed sentence. Sure. Um, I think my intentional searches for random coincidences juxtaposed against physical and sometimes emotional detachment found a voice here through blur in articulation in these multi-layered glimpses of frozen time. There's a little more, the placement, the closer distant proximity, the lighting, the shots I choose to keep and the ones I throw away, all narrate a search to find order in chaos through intense observation of the accidental commonalities that occur around us every day and every moment. I think that happens with me uh, no matter what I'm looking at. I think it was Leibowitz who said, you know, you don't turn it off. It, 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 you're a photographer. I don't remember the exact quote, but something about you're constantly composing all the time. Um, so uh, the last, uh, or see, was that what the last one, Paul, to be looking at all four? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. Um, if we go to um, the uh, hosta, okay, and just start at the top, and we'll just run down through these. Okay, this one is called Carnivali. Uh, it's act, it, originally it was printed. Um, about 20 by 20, excuse me, uh, 16 by 20, uh, but it's since uh, been printed much smaller. Um, I spent some time in a printmaking workshop in Florence many years ago, and I think the mask that I saw there left a big impression on me, so that's the title of this. Um, and I love how this feels like a drawing as well. Uh, next one, Paul. This is called Like a River. Um, Michael Krasowitz, you still there by any chance? I see his name there. I remember when I presented this at Slide Slam a few years back, uh, Michael had suggested that I might be interested in palladium printing. And I still would love to know more about that. Uh, th thank you, Paul. Uh, next one. Um, and this one is called River. Um, you know, I've seen these so many times in, uh, in a show where it, it plays off an image next to it. So it's hard for me to just react to it anymore. Uh, again, I, or by itself, but anymore, I, I, I think my um, drawing influence um, is obvious here. And just a couple more, Paul. Yeah, and also in a way, it's not unlike Andrea's hair series, the sort of geometries. Uh, let me ask you, Pamela, which artists, you know, because many come to mind, many of the great photographers, let me ask you, name me a couple of the, you know, the, let's say 1950s, 40s, 60s, which artists would you say um, you're excited by, you see your work aligning with in the history of photography? Well, it's, it's interesting because, I mean, Weston, uh, you know, there, there are people who, like, it's kind of obvious, but believe it or not, my, my sense of um, light and dark and rhythm doesn't necessarily come from a photographer. It comes from like Kathy Kalowitz in that dark, you know, 
moody kind of very dark uh, emotional feeling to it. Uh, the rhythm in this piece and in some of the staircase pieces, for me, um, I think of uh, Marcel Duchamp in New Descending a Staircase. Um, the color, uh, the, the, the MoMA uh, interaction series, some of the uh, movement, Giacometti, kind of the, the movement, the elongated figures. Um, oh, we didn't, I didn't show you. Oh, wait, we didn't get there yet. Okay. Uh, some of them are actually. Um, um, reminiscent of Francis Bacon, also. I'll jump to those in a little bit, too. Um, definitely, definitely. Thank you, Pamela. Thank okay. You. Um, are you a fan of Georgia O'Keeffe? I am. I, I'm a fan. Let me, let me uh, qualify that. I'm a fan of her compositions. I, I'm not, as much as I try to work in color, I always wind up um, making it more subdued because I'm more interested in, I guess, the geometric form and the light and shadow than I am the actual color. Um, but yes, I am. And, um, and, and again, to the earlier artist, there's the link of geometry and architect, architecture. You're more of a biomorphic form. You're going into the micro you're pulling out some macro at the same time. Really beautiful work, very moving. Oh, thank you. These were shot with my um, uh, 5D uh, with a 100 millimeter lens. Uh, the, some of the other work was shot, the MoMA series you'll see was actually uh, shot with a little tiny sure shot point and shoot that had an aperture or a shutter priority mode that allowed me to like practically hide the camera and be invisible while I was shooting. Uh, Paul, just keep going. I don't know if there's any more in this series or not. Uh, let's see. Um, Andrea Fortunoff says they remind her of sand dunes. Mm -hmm. Eileen Novak, Imogene Cunningham for sure. Um, Eileen Novak also likes the light, loves the light on this one. Wendy Friedman says the MoMA ones are my favorite. Can, Paul, can you open up the MoMA interactions? Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Okay. Uh, I see a little Giacometti here. Um, but again, uh, Obviously, I was looking for the, um, you know, serendipitous uh, positioning of the figure, of uh, the colors. But I also like for the pieces to maybe feel a little bit off. You know, like if, if it looks too perfectly composed, if it doesn't juggle your head a bit, jar your head a bit, I, 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 uh, I like for it to, to, to disturb you just a little bit. You know, the guy walking off to the right, that's not normally what you would do in a composition, but I, I love that it's, it's kind of unexpected. Uh, next one, Paul. Thanks so much, Paul. Oh, it has got stuck. Rathko. Yeah, now, uh, again, you know, the obvious, um, the obvious comparison here as far as color and stripe. Uh, it's interesting to see these all in a show where the um, horizon line, so to speak, of the, where the floor meets the wall were lined up to see them kind of bounce across the wall. You can keep going. Yeah, this is this one um, has an almost ethereal quality to me. Um, you know, I mean, she's the, the woman. Like for some reason, when I look at her, it's, it's almost a Mona Lisa type uh, kind of feeling. And then there, I mentioned before Francis Bacon, who is actually a, an artist who uh, I 
love his work. Uh, I love the transformations. Uh, next, Paul. Oh, this is uh, this is actually photo photo gallery. Uh, this is um, the series. This was uh, this past year. Um, the piece that's on the end there, which I think is next, the diptych, is uh, about 40 inches wide. And uh, I, I liked the, um, well, you'll see it in the next piece. So we'll go on to the next piece. Yeah, I, I like that break in the middle um, and then the reappearance on the other side there. And again, the person on the right, um, completely detached. Uh, nobody was really aware of me, but see if I can explain how I was feeling. Again, my, my reactions when I'm shooting are very visceral, very physical, so that as I was shooting, I felt the relationship between the painting, the observers and myself in that space. And I re-experienced that no matter what uh, series I'm working on when I'm editing. My goal when I'm editing is to try to bring that feeling again so that when I look at it, I see it. So if anybody wants, has a question, please jump in. Alyssa Pritzker says, I said, I sense a deep passion in all three of the presenters tonight, and thanks you all. Um, Andrea Fortunoff asked, do you plan on shooting at MoMA again? And how many times have you been back? Do you revisit your spaces? Um, I go, I haven't gone during COVID at all, but yes, I do plan on going back. Um, can you open the city, city perspectives? There's a few there that also, uh, actually, well, okay. It, there, there's some that uh, will speak to what I was just talking about before. This was coming out of the Javits Center uh, a couple of years ago. There was construction going on. Um, I, I love the architectural arrangement here of all the, the various uh, textures, line and form in negative positive space. Uh, you can just keep going through them, Paul. Thanks. What you're saying. Um, this has been shot many, many times. I've, but uh, I especially like the, the silhouette of the, the people inhabiting the, the balcony at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, this one was really tough to print. I print all of my own images and uh, I love printing. The, the finished image file for printing is very different uh, than what the screen version looks like because um, the blacks are really tough to print on the paper I use. They become super saturated and they just kind of lose their, their uh, detail. Uh, yeah, the MoMA guard, I've, I've shot guards a lot, a whole lot. Uh, again, here, it wasn't just about the guard, it was about the light on the fan, the light on his head, the light coming through the door, uh, you know, how it all worked together to create this particular mood. Um, next. Anyone know what this is? Any, the New York City Center? Just keep going. Shot a few years ago. Uh, this is uh, called Reflections on Sarah. Uh, this is when the Sarah exhibit was at MoMA. I was standing on the second floor, uh, obviously looking down at this and the reflections on the sculpture were from the people who were in front of me on the second floor. And again, it was that, it's like I hyper-focus on whatever is around me. And I like to, to, I would like to bring that attention to detail to other people through my work as well. And Paul, we must be about, let's see, could skip on, skip on down to wavy ascent. 
This is, uh, if you've walked on the High Line, you've probably seen this building um, many times. Um, I can't, maybe, uh, Andrea, I don't remember the name of the architect who did this. This is called the Switch Building. Ah, thank you, thank you. I, I love the undulating feeling of this as it uh, is moved. It, it was, it was in, you know, this, this was in uh, a show at uh, Alex Ferron Gallery, and it was interesting when she uh, posted it, she posted a video of it, and the video kind of uh, panned up the photo, which even added to the, the undulation of the, of the uh, shot. So, okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I don't want to take too long here. There's... Uh, yeah, we... I, I went ahead and I stopped screen sharing. First, thank you, Pamela. Thank you very much. And yes, thank you, Paul, for not only jumping in there, but whoa, very professional. Keep coming to ATOA Talks. You can help us too. Um, you know, I, I want to thank everybody. There was nice comments tonight. And uh, you had to see the synchronicities. Uh, Pamela, your work, uh, Andrea's an interest in architecture. There certainly are crossovers. But let's face it, there's, there's so many things out there. There's line and form and gesture and architecture, which actually swamps us. How can you not see it if you're in the city, same way if you're in the country? How can you not see the trees? Um, so uh, I want to thank you all for ATOA, for Artists Talk on Art. We're a 501c3. Our website has our history on it, future talks to come. Uh, we have interesting things coming all the time, a real diversity. If you'd like to present, go ahead, send me an email. I'll forward it to our programming committee. Special thanks to Pamela for organizing this and to Photo Photo Gallery and for dealing with technical difficulties. We always do, but we sort of work through it. And of course, to the artists who presented as well, to uh, Paul Mealy and Andrea Fortunoff. Uh, uh, we appreciate your time at the ATOA. And every time you join us, we're a little richer. You know, uh, we, it gives another facet to us, to our audience. And I thank you all for that, and of course, for your time. Keep coming. We are off next week for the holiday. Uh, the first week of uh, September. Happy Labor Day to everybody. Uh, thank you for the ATOA. I'm Barry. I told the artists. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Great job, everyone. Thank you, Barry. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Helene. Barry?